bless your holy name, God. We are more than deserving of all the worship that we could bring. So today we lift up our hands and we lift up our voices in complete awe of you, our King Jesus.
to our Lord. Glory to God. The word of God says in Matthew 21 verses 9 that the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Hosanna in the highest. Today, this morning, as we celebrate Palm Sunday, we want to say Hosanna to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What does Hosanna mean? It means victory in the name of our Savior. It means that He has won the battle and we have the victory in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. It was such a beautiful sight to see all of our palms up in the air and we're going to get ready to sing Hosanna once more. And I want you as a band of believers and for those of you joining us on the live stream platforms or visiting with us, pick up your palms wherever you are and we're going to celebrate that Christ is not dead but He is alive forevermore. Hallelujah. Let's pick up those palms. Hosanna. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest Lord, we lift up your name With our hearts full of praise We exalt you, O Lord our God Hosanna in the highest Hosanna, Hosanna our gracious eternal father we bow as a band of believers this morning to say hosanna to you O god in the highest thank you lord that you have conquered death and the grave thank you lord that we are victors in your victory thank you lord that we are more than able because of you who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light this morning lord we render unto you our praise our worship our salutations and father we thank you that we have life everlasting through the finished work on the cross of calvary so lord as we further tarry won't you have your own special way prepare our hearts oh lord as we prepare ourselves to listen to the word of god come to us through your servant this morning we pray lord that wherever the church of jesus christ meets that your name will be glorified and that lord we will be edified we give you all the praise glory and honor this morning lord we remember and we hold up our set man of god our pastors this morning bishop murdi and pastor natasha as they father our broad we pray your blessing over them and we pray, Lord, that you will bless every one of us, everyone connected to us this morning. May they know the saving grace of Jesus and the love of God in their lives. We bless you. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. One more time. Can we give the Lord a shout of praise? Hallelujah. Now, can we put our hands together for our Sunday school that did such a beautiful march past to celebrate Palm Sunday. Amen. Now before you sit, beloved, I want you to greet some people around you, show them the love of God, and then you can take your seats. Amen. Thank you, guys. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Oh yes, good morning to you. I greet you in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, to those of you that are visiting us this morning or watching us on the live stream, good morning. And thank you for making Bethsaida Ministries your house of worship. Let me greet you this morning on behalf of our pastors, our bishop, Emmanuel Joseph Mudley and Pastor Natasha Mudley, uh, who are away this morning in New Zealand. Now, uh, knowing our pastor, uh, I know he's taken some of that Springbok uh, blood.
to the All Blacks just to rub it in a little bit more. But we know and we uh, pray that he's in, they are enjoying uh, New Zealand and they will be back with us this week uh, to celebrate Easter. Uh, if you'd allow me a few moments just to go over some of our announcements uh, before we come to the word of the Lord. Amen. Uh, this Sunday at 3 p.m., our young adults will be having a special time of uh, coming together. Uh, they have a special uh, production. It's called Crossroads. So for those of you who are above the age of 20 and uh, below the age of uh, you still feel young, you're most welcome to uh, join our Young Adults Fellowship this uh, afternoon at 3 o'clock. They have a small clip, uh, so if you would cast your eyes to the screens, uh, they're going to play that clip right now. to 40 are you free this Sunday March 24th excellent join us on our young adults first ever stage performance with a fun filled evening packed with a powerful message activities for both ladies and gents there'll be refreshments provided as well as fellowship afterwards if you have little ones bring them along we have an area that caters for your little ones join us can't wait to see you Right. Thank you, young adults. Uh, if there's nothing else, there's going to be food, so make sure you're there. Right? But we're looking forward to that beautiful production. Uh, on the 27th of March, which is uh, this Wednesday, our senior citizens will be meeting at 10 a.m. at Clayfield. So senior citizens, please uh, do join. Uh, if you can, please give your names uh, so that they can cater for you adequately. But note that your meeting is this Wednesday. On Good Friday, the, which is this Friday, the 29th of March, uh, the BMI evangelistic team is going to be having an open air meeting uh, together with the Stonebridge area with their pastors and shepherds. Uh, we are going to be going to the very famous Sheikh Center. So for those of you who are in that area or would love to join uh, straight after service, our services are done here, we're going to be moving the gospel out of the uh, corridors and out of the walls of our premises and we're going to be going outside to minister to the people in Unit 4 Stonebridge. So you're most welcome to do that. Please keep our uh, evangelistic team in prayer uh, together with the leaders of that area as we take the gospel of Jesus Christ and the goodness of the cross uh, to the community this Friday. Uh, for those of you who uh, caught Pastor's announcement last week, uh, and you are an, um, passionate, uh, you're a passionate golfer, rather, please remember BMI's uh, first ever golf day is going to be taking place on the 17th of May at the Dur Durban Golf Club. Uh, it's in aid of our youth center, we're gonna, uh, our youth facility. So we're putting up some lovely sporting facilities for our uh, church. So please support that initiative. You can contact Brother Earl Peramal. Uh, if you wish to know exactly how the game is going to operate, it works with a four ball, you can co contact Pastor Clinton Samuel. He'll take you through exactly how the scores are going to be kept so that no one is cheated. Uh, for those of you who haven't played in a long time, you've got ample time to start practicing. Now, please don't practice those swings on anyone else. Only with your clubs and your golf balls, all right? But we're looking forward to seeing as many people. Please invite your corporate companies, your um, 
non-profit organizations, your uh, social clubs, uh, they are most welcome to join. For further details, I know it's 2,200 rand per four wall, so you are most welcome to get more information from our area leaders. Amen? Uh, on the 15th of June, as Pastor has said, uh, Ignite the Fire will be taking place at Moses Mabida Stadium, where we're coming together to worship God and to bring down the presence of God over our city. So please take note of that date, and we know that you will all uh, support this initiative. For those of you wishing to walk through the waters of baptism, please note that our baptism classes start today, this, uh, uh, the 24th of March, and It'll continue on Tuesday, the 26th of March, and then on Sunday, the 31st, at 10 a.m. at our BMI Stonebridge boardroom. So for those of you wanting to walk through the waters of baptism, please do attend those classes. It is uh, very crucial before you do so. Uh, kindly take note of our Easter services, Good Friday, uh, the 29th of March. At 7 a.m. and 8.30, our services will be as usual. So it's this Friday. Please get to one of our services, and you will be blessed uh, this Good Friday. Uh, our Easter Sunday services will be on the 31st of March and the same times, 7 a.m. at Clayfield and 8.30 at Stonebridge. Thereafter, at 11 a.m. will be our Easter baptism. So you don't want to miss that. For those of you getting baptized, those of you uh, wishing to do so, uh, Please do attend those classes, and it will take place on the 31st of March uh, with our bishop. So God bless you. Are you blessed still in the house of the Lord? Amen. The news is always uh, long at times. But we thank God that in the presence of God and in the house of Vatseda, all news is good news. Amen. So God bless you as you uh, remember those dates and prepare your hearts. Uh, beloved, it, at this time, we're going to get ready to listen to the Word of God come to us by a dynamic servant of God that has been sold out for Christ and doing great exploits. So I pray that you will prepare your hearts at this time. Uh, Pastor Ron Lewis is the president and founder of Teen Mania Ministries, a Christian youth organization that reaches millions of young people worldwide. Pastor Ron passionately declares the truth of the gospel without compromise as he challenges teenagers to take a stand for Christ in their schools, communities, and throughout the world. Raised in a broken home, Pastor Ron ran away at the age of 15 and became involved in drug and alcohol abuse before finding Jesus at the age of 16. The life-transforming impact of Christ inspired Pastor Ron to dedicate his life to reaching young people. After receiving both bachelor's and master's degrees in counseling and psychology, Pastor Ron and his wife Katie started Teen Mania in 1986 with nothing more than a hatchback car, nothing wrong with that, and a dream to raise up an army of young people who would change the world. He has received an honorary doctorate by Jerry Falwell from Liberty University and was appointed by President George Bush to serve as an advisory member for the commission and drug-free communities from 2002 to present. We have someone that is sold out for the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Seda, won't you help me welcome, putting your hands together, Pastor Ron Lewis. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. I bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters in the United States of America. Do you know you have family there? Yes, we all have the same Father, the same Lord. And what a pleasure it is to be in Durban, where you have improved upon curry. That's what I keep hearing. I've tasted it. I love the butter chicken. I had some other curries last night. And um, if, it, if it wasn't just the beauty to come back for, it's the food to come back for. So it's a pleasure to be here. And on Palm Sunday, what a Sunday. This is the Sunday. You remember they, they were all waving their palm branches and shouting. What were they shouting? Hosanna. And do you all know what that word means? So I sang that word for many, many years in songs, you know, very spiritual. Oh, Hosanna. I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> then I found out what it meant. It literally means save us. So imagine this. Jesus is riding on the donkey, and the crowd starts pointing the palm branches, branches down, saying, save us, save us, save us. 
or you, you are, you're the only one that could save us. They'd heard that a Messiah might be coming, and they were hoping, a lot, most of the Jews were hoping they would save them from the Roman government because they were all slaves to Rome. They were hoping he would turn, overturn the government, save us from that. Now, probably the disciples were like, save us from ourselves, from our sin, from the enemy, from the devil. But um, so that's what they were shouting as he's riding into town. And so we're shouting, Hosanna, Lord, save us. Or we've already been saved. Thank you for saving us. You're the only one that could save us. How many believe that? Amen. Now, if I could, just before we get into the scripture, uh, just tell you a little bit about myself so we can be friends. Is that OK? Uh, First of all, I was shocked the first time I came to Durban and I found Indian people speaking with a South African accent. Because I've been to India many times. Like, they look the same, but they don't sound the same. They're easier to understand, though, for me. So, and, um, so I grew up, though, in, in uh, California. And, and the, California uh, isn't the most spiritual of places, right? And so. Uh, my parents were divorced and remarried three different times, three different people. And my, uh, we grew up going to church, though. We were, we were a good church-going family. We weren't really Christians, but church-going. And I went to every dead, dry, boring, regurgitated, petrified version of church you could ever imagine. I hated going to church. I thought I was going to jail every Sunday. I felt like I was going to a funeral every Sunday. You know, the big big uh, organ uh, uh, and looking around everybody looked old I was like man did somebody die this week felt like a funeral to me I was trying to escape so I escaped finally when I was 15 I ran away to go find my dad I hadn't seen my dad since I was seven and my dad the very first night I'm with him gave me some profound advice he said son if you're gonna try any marijuana you be sure and bring it home so we can all try it together and I thought, I have the coolest dad in the world. And I remember the Bible said somewhere you're supposed to obey your parents. Selective obedience, right? So I felt obligated. So I went to school and found uh, some marijuana and brought it home. And my, my, my stepmom and my dad and I would, would smoke and, and, and sm get high. And then I started drinking and drugs and things. And, um, and I thought I was living the dream. But... My life is getting worse. So about a year later, a friend invites me to church. How many ever invited somebody to church before? A few people. How many ever invited somebody to church that you didn't think would say yes, but you invited them anyways? That was me. Like, nobody ever invited me because they didn't think I would say yes. Finally, my friend invites me. And I'll go, sure, I'll go to church. God's cool. I'm cool. We'll get along fine. So you can see how arrogant I was. And on the way into church, my friend says, I hope you're used to those churches where people lift their hands. I said, lift their hands? Why? Do they have questions? I, I, I couldn't imagine why people, I thought it was like at school or something, because not, just, just come inside. So then the, um, I come inside, and these people were like singing with all their heart. What happened to these people? I'm looking at their faces. They're smiling real big and look kind of looking up to the sky. I'm like, what happened to these people? Some of them are crying. What happened to them? They're crazy, just like you guys. And um, so I was in the back, and I was, I was trying to figure out who they were looking at because they were kind of looking up to the sky, you know? And I was like, and I thought they were looking onto the stage at their pastor. And they're singing these passionate songs. I, they sounded like love songs. I thought, wow, these people love their pastor. They're singing love songs to their pastor, song after song after song. And finally, I looked on the screen. I saw these words. I was 16. I wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer, right? I saw these words they were singing. They were singing words to Jesus. I thought, these poor people, they think Jesus can hear them when they sing. And then something flashed through my mind. I wonder if he can. Isn't that wild? I was in church my whole life. It never even crossed my mind that Jesus might be able to hear us. Then the preacher got up and began to speak regular words. He didn't just use these and thou's. He's like, read the Bible and then explained it. I thought, I didn't know this was legal. Preachers could use regular words. And I'm sitting there thinking, 
I have been lied to my whole life. I've been in church my whole life. No one told me, no one explained how great it is to really follow Jesus. In regular words, no one had to twist my arm. Just explain it to me. So I'm in. Give my life. I'm going to follow Jesus. And I go back to school trying to tell people about Jesus, even though I didn't know what I was talking about. How many ever tried that? You didn't know what you were talking about, but you tried anyways. That was me. And so that was the beginning of my life with Christ. I mean, after growing up in dead, dry, boring churches, it was really refreshing. In fact, one church I grew up in was so dead, you have to ask the question, how dead, how dead was it? You have to ask me. It sounds like a joke. This is not a joke. I remember this as a child. These ushers had made poles, and at the end of the pole, they had a little tennis ball they'd fixed on the edge of the pole, and they would patrol the aisles during the sermon, looking for anybody that nodded off. And if you nodded off, they'd take that pole with that little ball, that little ball and they'd push your head back up like that. Now you know you're going to a dead church if you got ushers with poles patrolling the aisle to keep you awake. I think we're in good shape here this morning. I don't see any poles in the house, so I'm happy for, about that. So, are we friends yet? Good. So we're going to uh, get into the scripture today. What a great day to talk about revival, sustained personal revival on a Palm Sunday. Now, we always, especially in the spirit-filled community, we talk a lot about revival. Have you gone to this revival? We need another dose of the Holy Spirit. You know, if we stayed vived, we wouldn't have to be revived. The word revive, vive, is where we get the word life. So revival is like re-life. It's like giving CPR to somebody that's almost ready to die. But if we stayed healthy spiritually, we wouldn't almost die spiritually. Can I have an amen, somebody? So how do we have sustained personal? Like it goes on and on and on. We don't get on fire, fall away, get on fire, fall away, get on fire, fall away. Now, so I want you to imagine. How many of you guys have a good imagination? So imagine this morning you're on the beach. You don't have to imagine very easily, very hard, uh, very, very difficult because it's, the beach is right here. But imagine it's about, you know, it's warm outside. You feel the warm sand between your toes. And today the beach is calling, come to me. I love you. And so you think I'm going for a swim. So you're out there frolicking around in the wonderful um, Indian Ocean out there. And, uh, and all of a sudden you look back and you see you're about two kilometers away from the shore. And you think, oh no, I better swim back. So you start swimming back because you're going to get washed out to sea. But on your way back, you start hearing the, this thundering, crashing wave. And you look over and there's like a wall of water about 100 meters long. And you're thinking, I'm going to get slammed into the sand with the wave. And so you turn back around, you're swimming back out to sea. And there you are swimming as passionately as you can so you don't get caught in that way, but it's to no avail. And it pulls you in, and you're going around and around and around. And you come up for air, and you get sucked back under. You come up for air, and you get sucked back under. And one of the times you come up and you see some of your spouse and some of your kids, and they're doing the same thing, and they get sucked back under and come up for air. And then you look again, you see some friends from church, people you work with, and they're all doing the same thing, trying to catch their breath as they swirl around in these waves. You realize you're going to be there for a while, so you think, well, maybe we should just plan to have lunch up here, have dinner up here, have our meals on the top of the wave. Welcome to our new normal all around the world. After the pandemic, with so much change so fast, people kept wondering during the pandemic, what will the new normal look like? What will, what will happen when the waves of change calm down? Well, the new normal is they're not calming. There's more and more change. Imagine 10 pandemics at once, but only one's a virus, one's economic, one's governmental, one's technology. And they go on and on, and they're all converging all at the same time on the waves of change. And we're like, well, when's it going to come down, calm down so we can get on with our normal life? Well, our normal life is how do we live in the middle of this? Because we have all kinds of new technologies, new things coming our way. Oh, now this is new social media. Oh, what about this program? Or what about this thing? What are they teaching in schools now? And we're like, bam, bam, getting slapped back and forth with all these crazy things coming our way. And of course, our young people, how many of you are young? 
How many are young in heart? All those old people just lifted their hands. Get caught mostly in these waves of change. Whoa, what's happening? What? And you find out from them what the latest thing is. So we've got to learn how to do this. In the midst of all the waves, how to surf the waves of change. This is a championship surfer, Rodrigo, from South America, surfing a massive wall of water. What if we could do that as followers of Christ? What if we could be the ones surfing the waves of change so we're no longer intimidated by all the crazy stuff going on and the new trend here and the new thing? That we're like, it's nothing but a thing. We learn to live our life, our Christian life, in the middle of all the crazy trends and crazy changes that are going on, and we're rescuing people that are caught in the undertow all along the way. Amen? So maybe you didn't come to church today expecting surfing lessons, but hopefully you'll have a few tips on how to surf the waves of change by the time we leave here today. So we're going to read some words from Scripture. How many guys like the Bible? And we're going to read specifically Jesus' words. How many like Jesus' words? Oh, good. Almost everybody. We're going to read these uh, and then see what the Lord has for us. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Everyone who hears my teaching and applies it to his life can be compared to a wise man who built his house on the unshakable foundation. When the rains fell and the flood came, with fierce wind beating on upon his house, it stood firm because of its strong foundation. But everyone who hears my teaching and does not apply it to his life can't be compared to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. When it rained and rained and the flood came, with wind and waves beating upon the house, it collapsed and was swept away. So, Jesus, this morning we're asking you to just come and open up our ears that we could understand just a little more of what you meant when you said this. Holy Spirit, we're asking you to speak to our hearts. Father, we're asking you to come, be the Lord of these moments together, that we might become more like your son, Jesus. It's his name we pray. Amen. So these words Jesus uttered at the end of what's called the uh, Sermon on the Mount. It's five chapters, Ma Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and 7. It's one long teaching, one long sermon, story after story after story, parable after parable. And after he's all done, he says, now, everything you've just heard, if you take it into your life and build your life on it, build your house on it, literally, you will stand when the storms of life come. But if you don't, if you listen and listen, but you still just live the way you're living, the storms will come and you'll get washed away. Just the hearing part of it doesn't make you strong. It's the hearing and the doing. Can I have an amen? It's the hearing and the doing. Who does these things will be blessed. Now, you know when you see a house, you can have a house built on sand and a house built on the rock. And when you first look at the two different houses, you can't tell the difference because they all look beautiful. They all look brand new. And that's how it is in life. People look successful. They've got the nice clothes or the car. They got a good Instagram. They got whatever. And, you know, the perfect little family going on. And they all look the same. You can't tell who's built their life on the rock until a storm comes. It rains on the just and the unjust. Storms come. Jesus, instead of avoiding storms, he says, let me give you the ability to stand strong during the storms. To have a life, the best teaching that's ever been given is Jesus' words. He's not just a guru. He's not just another leader of a religion. He's the guy that made the heavens and the earth. He invented life. He's the only one that knows how it should be lived. So building our life, we protect ourselves from the storms. He says, build your house. House is a metaphor for your life. Literally, they had their life in their house, like they had their business as a like next to their house or on, you know, as an, a, a, an addendum, a room at their house. They were a carpenter. They were a carpenter at their house. They didn't have a shop. It was right there at the house. So building your house is building your life. So somebody who builds their life, this is not somebody who just prays a prayer, hey, I want to go to heaven. This is somebody who builds their life on the things of God. That's what Jesus called a disciple. So but, but what does a disciple actually do? You know, we use that word, and I'll say in the, in the United States, we'll use that word as a kind of a, um, a spiritual sounding word, but we don't really know what it means very much. If we think anything, we think, oh, it's the classes, 
that you take for four weeks right after you get saved and then you just live how you did before. But authentic, honestly, uh, disciples are different. In fact, uh, you, you'll see all through Scripture. You remember the, big, the Great Commission was, Go ye therefore and make converts. Is that what it was? Yes or no? Their whole commission was to make disciples. Somebody say disciple. So it's one of those spiritual words, but what does it actually mean? Well, you see it scattered all through the New Testament, especially in Acts where the apostles were going out, and you can see all these different verses. The number of disciples increased greatly. You know, they, it, the disciples grew rapidly here and there. Sometimes it says Jesus was speaking to the crowds and to the disciples. In other words, just because you're in a crowd hearing about the Lord doesn't mean you're a disciple. It says Jesus spoke to the crowd and to the disciples. He wanted everyone to be disciples, but just because you're in a crowd hearing about the Lord doesn't mean you're a disciple. You can tell who the disciples were because when Jesus was done talking, he would walk away and the disciples would follow, asking questions. What do you mean by that? What about, what about that? What about that? They wanted to know. The crowds came, you know, for the free food. Fish and loaves. Crowds came for the miracles. Whoa, I want, what is he going to do this time? Crowds came for the entertainment. You know, entertainment back then was telling stories. Jesus is telling stories. He's an entertainer. But they didn't want to build their life on it. Disciples wanted to learn more so they could change how they lived. So don't get confused. Just because you're in a crowd that's talking about the Lord on church, in church or Sunday doesn't necessarily mean you're a disciple. You can see that Jesus, he wants, and the, and the apostles wanted everybody to be disciples. But just because you're in the crowd doesn't automatically make you one. So what is, what is a disciple? Like, what does a disciple actually do? Well, first of all, definition would help. I like this one. There's a lot of different definitions. I like this one. It's the lifelong pursuit. How long? Lifelong pursuit of becoming more like Jesus. By learning from him and experiencing him. So it's lifelong. It never ends. It's not a class you take. It's not a degree you get. If you say, I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, this is what we do for the rest of our life. We want to become like Christ. How many would like to become more like Jesus like today? And about tomorrow, how, how many would like to become more like Jesus tomorrow? Do you know what? It's not an accident. It's not like, wow, I accidentally became more like Jesus. It's because we keep learning from him and letting him shape our life. Like a sculptor. You know, like a little chisel. This is what the Lord wants to do with us every day. But if we don't go to his workshop and let him go, then we don't become like Christ. His workshop is when we spend time with him alone, we open up the Bible, and we start reading it, and he goes, and he starts chiseling away at parts of our flesh, parts of our heart, part of our life. And we start seeing a glimpse of what Christ looks like coming through. So what, what does this mean? Like, what does a disciple actually do? do you know, and let me just give you a couple thoughts on this, give you some uh, uh, ways of thinking about being a disciple. How would you like to be a better disciple when, we, when you leave here today? Yes or no? Okay, so watch this. First of all, how many are glad that Jesus changed your life? How many felt like the Lord changed your life when you first gave your life to him? Of course he did. Now, there's two kinds of transformation. There's instant transformation, happens like this, and then there's process transformation. So the transformation that happens in a moment is like when you first come to the Lord, he gives you a brand new heart. He forgives you in a moment. He takes the weight of sin and takes it off you. Whoa, I'm free and I'm forgiven. Maybe you've, uh, you've had other pain in your life and he's healed you of those memories, things that have happened to you, or maybe you got healed in an instant physically. So there's, there's instant moment in transformation that happens in a moment, but then there's process transformation. Like, for example, character. You don't get that in a moment. That comes with a process. When you get free of something, you can get set free in a moment. But if you want to stay free, that's a process. Putting scripture in your, in, in your life and into your heart. Building a good name, renewing your mind, staying free of old habits. It's all a process. Most of the transformation that happens in our life is through a process, not an instant. And the process is when we go to the workshop with the Lord every day and we let him refine us. We talk a lot about the instant 
you know, a transformation, but we don't talk a lot about what happens in the process. And so this is what we learned. We did study with churches all around the world that are the very best at reaching and discipling young people. They put a transformational process together. So it's not, not just, did you read that book? Did you study that thing? Did you go to that class? That's all didactics, stuff in your head. That's important. But we all know people that have learned lots of verses, but they're still as mean as a hornet, right? So it's not just learning scripture. It is that, but it's, trans, it's taking that inside and letting God transform us. So they put this transformational process together. This is what's supposed to happen, not just for young, but for young and old. When we go to the workshop every day with Jesus, opening the Bible, spending time with him. And so the thing that we found so remarkable is we found 14-year-olds discipling 13-year-olds, 15-year-olds discipling 14-year-olds, all the way up to 20, 21 years old. So you know all the waves of change? Young people are the most caught in that, the most like susceptible to get sucked into those waves. And so how many of you actually, are your parents, let me see your hand if you're a parent. How many are your parent of teenagers? Let me see your hand. Oh, we could all tell by your face you didn't need to raise your hand. You know, every parent in the world, it seems, as soon as they know they're going to have a 13-year-old, they're like, oh, no, they're panicking, they're panicking. And they, well, how do you make sure that your young person doesn't get sucked into the craziness? Well, helping them become a disciple, building their young life as 13 and 14 and 15-year-olds on the things of God. And so we learned from churches around the world some uh, how to have some tools that actually help you. And I brought up a couple of these with me today. We actually got some printed right here in Durban in case anybody here wanted one. Let me just show you. If you're a parent, this might be something that will bless you. So this first book, it's a series, but this is the first one called Pathway to Freedom. And it's just a tool because a lot of parents are like, how do I disciple my kids? I bring them to church. That's not discipling. That's good, but it's not discipling. So what this is, it looks like a book, but it's not a book. Pretty good uh, uh, disguise, right? It's, it's uh, 12 weeks of something to do every day for you in the Lord. Like two or three pages a day, there's things to write down. Here's a verse. What do you think that means? Here's another verse. What do you think? And at the end of each week, there's some discussion questions. So if you're wondering, how can I help my own teenager not get sucked into the world? You know, the culture's coming after our kids. Just bringing them to church will not protect them from the culture, from the garbage on the Internet. But if you take them on a journey, so this is some, uh, just a practical thing. You could take one of your young people, buy one for you, get one for you, one for your kids, and just say, hey, let's go on a journey together. And each week we'll talk about it. There's discussion questions. And talk about how it applies to your life, just a tool. And if you're really crazy, there's a follow-up helping to turn them into a leader. This is called Pathway to Leadership. Same thing, something to do every day in your quiet time for 12 weeks. So it's just a journey. It's a practical thing to do. So let's talk about what are the disciples, uh, the habits of a disciple? What do the disciples actually do? So we found six verbs, only six. Come on, how hard can it be? Six things. Anybody can do six things, right? And these are, these are not obligations. These are opportunities. So following, seeking, renewing, transforming, connecting, engaging. I'm going to try to get to as many of these as we can here this morning because I wanted you to be able to leave with not a list of obligatory things, but a list of empowering things, things that will help you. Like, wow, I love doing this thing called uh, following Jesus and being a disciple. So uh, let's talk about following. So a disciple is a follower. So when you look in the Bible and you, and you ask, um, when Jesus was talking, how did he describe a human getting connected to his father. The most common way he described it is follow me. 32 times in the four gospels, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Take up your cross, follow me. You know, when Jesus gave an altar call, he didn't go, everybody bow your head, close your eyes. As the choir sings, I don't embarrass anybody, just, just come follow me. He didn't do that, he said, follow me. And he just walked away. Whoever followed him, followed him to the next village, literally. Whoever didn't, didn't. They wanted to know more. They wanted to ask questions. When we talk about Christianity and Jesus, God stuff, we say it lots of ways. Are you saved? Do you accept the Lord? Have you received the Lord? Do you have a personal relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? And we have all kinds of ways that we talk about. It. Have you been born again? If you confess your mouth, believe in your heart, Jesus, Lord. And we say all kinds of things, and we confuse 
people that are non-Christians, sometimes we even confuse ourselves. We use all these phrases interchangeably. We say John 3, 16, those who believe in him will not perish have everlasting life. Do you believe in him? Oh, good. I guess I'm saved. Really? Well, I believe the sky is blue and the grass is green. Now I believe in Jesus. Is that the same thing? Honestly, it's not. You've believed so much that he's the son of God that I'm going to start following him, his way of living, his way to be a human, his way to treat each other. So another translation of this word, or this phrase, follow me, is this. Walk with me. One translation says, he's inviting us. Walk with me. Walk with me. Just walk with me. Now, um, no, the word follow, follow me, is, is an action word. It's not a passive word. Sometimes the words that we use when we describe Christianity and how to become connected to the Lord are passive. Like those who receive the Lord, he gives power to become sons of God. That's one time in John. But the word receive, in our English language, we, it sounds like a passive word. But in Greek, that word receive means to grab a hold like a bulldog and never let go. Those who grab a hold like a bulldog and never let go. He gets power to become sons of God. When you use words like accepting the Lord, the problem is the word acceptance is a passive word. So I accept the Lord, and then, and then we, um, like, leave me alone. We, we turn into a passive pew sitter if we do something passive. It sets the tone for how we think Christianity is normal. So we become like the guy that got married, and five years later his wife says, you don't tell me you love me anymore. Ten years later, you don't tell me you love me anymore. Fifteen years later, she says, you don't tell me you love me anymore. Finally, the man says, I, on the day we got married, I told you I love you. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. I think that's how we treat God sometimes, you know. Yeah, Jesus gave your life. I'll see you in heaven. Kind of a passive acceptance. You know, if we have to you know, if, if people are passive, then we have to beg them to come to church and beg them to read their Bible and beg them to live pure, beg them to tithe, beg, 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 beg. So, when I learned all this, I started changing how I talk. I started changing how I talk to people about Jesus. I started changing the way I did altar calls. The goal is not just to get saved. The goal is to become a lifelong follower of Jesus. Let's just talk about following for a second. So, um, uh, how do you follow somebody you can't see? Like back then, they could follow him because they, they saw him and they just literally follow him. But now, like maybe somebody that's not a Christian might say, how do you follow a dead guy? Well, of course, we're on the inside scoop. We know the dead guy is not dead, right? Can I have an amen? Yeah. But he still, you can't see him with your eyes. How do you follow somebody who's invisible? You can't see. Well, how, many, how do you follow a sports team that you've never met in person? How many have a favorite sports team? Football or soccer or some other sport, rugby or something like that? Let me see your hand. If you have, I'm not, it's not a sin to have a favorite sports team. How do you follow them? You never met them in person. Well, you watch them on TV. You know, you, you follow their stats. You know, are they going to go to the championship? Your favorite player, how are they doing? I mean, you're looking at all that kind of stuff. So you follow that team. Oh, no, they'll never win. They never will. How do you know that? Because you follow them. Isn't it interesting? We, sometimes we know more stats and data about our favorite sports team than we do about Jesus. Because we follow them. So I wasn't very good at sports growing up. I didn't want my son to have the same challenge. So I would take him to ball games, and he played on teams and stuff. But we'd go to some professional t uh, uh, games a couple times a year. We'd see, go see baseball games. So one time we went to a baseball game, uh, Texas Rangers, and, they, um, and he brought a friend. And we're sitting, you know, about, they're about nine years old. And, you know, I, I know how the game is played. I know the rules, but um, I don't, I'm not really a follower. I don't know all the details about every player. But as we're sitting there, there's these guys behind me that knew everything. They're going, yeah, that guy was the MVP last year, and that guy won, th you know, he hit three home runs last week, and they're telling all the stuff. I'm listening really carefully. Later on in the game, I go, hey, you guys, to my son and his friend, you know, that guy was the MVP last year. That guy hit three home runs last week. 
And my son was like, my dad is so smart. I'm, I wasn't a follower, but I just overheard a follower. And I repeated a follower. And I'm afraid that's what we have a lot of times in our Christian circles. People come to an event, like a Sunday morning, and they overhear the follower. The follower is the pastor. And he's preaching or something, and you're like, yeah, I kind of heard that. You're like, yeah, that's and I repeat it. And this happens a lot. You can tell who's a follower or who's not. Um, happens a lot in um, American politics. They're getting ready for an election, and they all want the Christians to vote for them, right? So they're quoting something or acting like they're Christians or like they have Christian friends. And you can always tell if they're a follower or not because they'll say, yeah, like my favorite verse in John 16, 3 says, right. You don't even have that verse straight. You're not really a follower. And I'm afraid we have a lot of people that are attendees. They call themselves Christians, but they're not really followers of Jesus. Somebody say, ouch. So follower, like how do you follow somebody you've never met? Like or in person, like a, a favorite band, favorite artist. How many have a favorite uh, artist or band that you love their music? Let me see your hand. How many of you are so, they, you love them so much, you like, you know every song that they ever recorded, like you know it. You know all the lyrics. Some of you are more intense than that. You know where they were when they wrote the song, how the band got together, drama that's happening in the band. You're stalkers, that's what you are. You're stalking them online. And uh, so, you know, stalking used to be pretty hard. Um, to, you know, you used to have to stand outside somebody's door and look in the window. But now you can stalk people online, right? And, uh, and you know, when you talk about following, there's a lot of said about, do you follow this influencer? Do you follow this person on Instagram or Facebook? Jesus isn't looking for that kind of follower. He's looking for a follower. We, we were the ones that say, you have the words of life. I'm going to change all of my habits based on what I learned from you. So stalking has gotten kind of a bad name. People do it online. Maybe you felt stalked by your own pet, looking for food that you might drop, you know, little crumbs here and there. Uh, stalking is that thing that happens, and you don't know what's happening. But stalkers, that's what they do. They stalk. I mean, they're constantly looking um, what the other person's doing, looking for secrets that no one else knows. You're looking online. Where are the God stalkers? Where are the bloodhounds that are sniffing out the things of God? I want to follow him. I want to seek him. I want to know him. They're in the Bible. They're learning. They're spending time. That's what he's looking for. When he talks about followers, that's what he's looking for. Think about it like this. Disciples are followers. Imagine this. Like you're born. We're all born on a path. And that pathway that we're on is all about me. My fun, my stuff, my money, my career, my family, me, 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 me. If you don't believe me, those of you that have had a, a little baby, gets hungry, wah, we put a bottle. Good, it's all about me. And the whole world starts revolving around them when they're very little. When I cry, I get my way. And in some way, even as teenagers and adults, we all sort of let everything revolve around us until one day, we find out there's another path. There's another, this, uh, there the path is following Christ, not self. Following Christ, not sin. Following Christ, not culture. And you're like, hmm, that's another path. Jesus came and described it. Preachers try to describe it. And you realize there's a fork in the road. You can't just go on the same path. You've got to make a decision which path you're going to be on. So then you're wrestling with the decision. Which path should I go on? Myself, my sin, my life, me, 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 or following Christ. So you're counting the cost. You're thinking about it. The problem is, Jesus said, if you want to follow him, there's two things he's asked for. Number one, forgive, ask forgiveness. And number two, repent. Two things. Forgive, Lord, please forgive me for walking on my path about my sin, my life, me, me, me. Me centered is over. Please forgive me. And then repenting is literally changing your mind and going on to the other path. I'm going to change my mind about everything I've learned in the world, and I'm going to follow the teachings of Christ. So he asked for both. The problem is, too often, we just do one. Lord, please forgive me. Lord, I'm so sorry. Lord, please forgive me. And then we stay on the same path. And then a month later, we come back to church. We hear a sermon. Lord, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And we stay on the same path. 
A year later, same thing. Lord, please forgive me. And we keep asking forgiveness, but we never became a follower. We never changed paths. And we wonder, why do I still have the pain, the same pain, the same challenges, the same problems? Well, it's because you never changed paths. And then they give up. Forget this Christian thing. It doesn't work anyways. Well, it doesn't work like that. It was never meant to. So we have a lot of people that pray to prayer, surrender to the Lord, maybe ask forgiveness, but they never change pathways. They call themselves Christians, but they're not really followers of Jesus. Does that make sense? And they get so frustrated and they're barely hanging on, then some just leave the church. Being followers mean I'm... I've th Lord, thank you for the forgiveness, but I've changed pathways. I'm taking my marching orders from the kingdom, from the words of life that you have, Jesus. I'm going to change my habits based on what I know to be real. And so, maybe you're even in this room and you felt that frustration because you've asked forgiveness a million times, but you still feel so broken. Listen, if you have not got yourself and chosen the second path, you still reap the benefits of the brokenness of this world because you haven't started building your house on the rock yet. You're feeling forgiveness, and that's great, but you're not feeling the strength of somebody who's been redeemed, who can see through the lies, and instead of building our life on deception the world gives us, we are students, we're disciples, we're learning, we're following a new path. So, Jesus invites us to walk with him. We arrange our whole life around the transformation that he wants to do. He invites us today, walk with me, walk with me. I'm going to show you how to walk, show you how to live. So the goal is not simply to go to heaven, thank God for that, but it's not just that. It's like, that's what happens the first step. So you, so you, 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 you see the two paths, you say, okay, would you, would you want to become a follower? And they say, yes. And so you put your foot here, you say, yes, Lord, I give you my life. I'm going to ask forgiveness. I'm going to become a follower. And that very first step, Whoa, you get born again. Hi, ah, you get a brand new heart. You get the weight of the world, the sin off your shoulders, and it's only the first step. Imagine the next step, and the next step, and the next, the rest of our life following him, getting more free, more full of life, more solid in how we're living because the waves of the world are not overcoming us. You ever met somebody? They, uh, they go, uh, you got a favorite band, and you're talking with somebody, and, hey, they have the same favorite band as you. And then somebody else jumps up, say, oh, that's my, I like that band too. And then you say, what's your favorite song? Oh, you know that one that kind of goes, la, 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 and they, the phrase everyone in the whole world knows. And you're like, you're not really a follower. You're a poser. You're pretending so that you can be a part of us. And I'm afraid even in Christian circles, Praise the Lord, glory to God, hallelujah, amen. We know all the catchphrases, but are we really followers? The goal is not just to get to heaven, but to be, become a lifelong follower. How do you follow somebody that you can't see? It's real simple. You, first of all, follow his words, his teachings. You read, what does he say? Number two, you follow him, his lifestyle, like how he said to live. You look at the way he treated people. We treat people that way. And then we follow him personally every day, like we step with him. Let him whisper to your soul step by step. So followers don't have to be begged to follow. They just follow. I will say this, that um, there's some secular people in Antioch. And they were looking around. They saw some people. Like, hey, is that Christ? No, that's Peter. Man, Peter sure is acting a lot like Christ. Is that Christ? No, that's John. He sure is acting a lot like Christ. Is that Christ? No, that's Phoebe. Or that's Mary. The, all these people are acting like Christ. They're following his lifestyle so closely, they look just like him. The secular people said, let's give him a nickname. Let's call him Little Christ. So they gave the followers of the way, that's what they were known before, they called him Little Christ. Look at this group of Little Christ. That's where we get our word Christian. Today, we call ourselves Christians and don't look anything like Christ. How many think that would be the best compliment you could ever get, that you followed him so closely, you looked like him, and you got mistaken for Christ? How many think that would be a great compliment to get? That's our path as disciples. That's what we're aiming for. So followers don't have to be begged to follow a team or follow a band. They just follow. Followers follow. Pastor Emmanuel shouldn't have to, come on, please love God. Come on, please love the Bible. Come on, please love. Followers follow. 
This is what we do. And then we get together on Sunday and talk about all of our following stuff and then get inspired to follow even more. Followers follow. Can I have an amen? So we have a little bit more time. Should I go to the next one? Uh, so let's, um, disciples are following, they're seeking. Now we all know this verse, right? Seek ye first the what? If you don't know, one of the words is right here. If you seek ye first the, it's right there. And all his righteousness and all these things will be what? Let's talk about, so, so disciples are followers, but they're also seekers. They're seekers of the kingdom. So um, let's just ask, ask you a question. How many ever um, lost your keys before? Keys to your house, keys to your car. How many ever lost them? How many ever like really, really lost them? And you're like, you're going crazy. I gotta find my keys. How many have like had that? How about like you recruit the whole family? Find my keys, find my keys. Everybody's looking. Anybody? That urgency, like my, if I don't make this appointment, if I don't find these keys, something bad's gonna happen. I'm gonna get fired or whatever. What if we were to seek the Lord like that? Like seek his kingdom, like lost keys. How about this? Anybody here ever, um, ever lost your phone before? I mean, really lost your phone. Like the crazy kind of, I lost my whole life. How many ever lost it like that? How many started going crazy? How many ever lost your phone while you're talking on it? I can't find it anywhere. <laughs> you recruit everybody. We gotta find my phone, we got to. All my contacts are there, everything's there, everything's saved on there. What if we were to seek the Lord like we're seeking a lost phone? You know, what if um, we were that intense, that proactive, that desperate to seek him? We've all probably done this where you're seeking your phone and it's on silence. You can't even call it. You're listening to it vibrate or something. You're hoping, uh, it, you know, you can actually find it. Um, so what is it? Why would the Lord say, seek me first? Is he such an egomaniac? I want to be number one because I'm the best. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. Or is it that he wants to be sought? How many of you are married? Let me see your hand. So I know every culture is a little bit different, but tell me if you remember this. When you were thinking about that guy or that girl, being romantic with them before, long before you were married, Hopefully you're thinking about it after you're married too. But, um, and you're wondering, I wonder if they like me. I wonder if she likes me. In whatever culture you have, do you have to talk to the parents first? Or, you know that little, that little like, is it a little glimmer in their eye? Is it a little smile? I'm not really sure. Or they're not giving you anything. So you, it's really a mystery to you. And you're a little bit afraid to let your, your feelings be known because you don't know if they'll be reciprocated. Does this happen here? It's sort of the cat and mouse game, like who should be the first to bear their, their soul or share their feelings or give a hint. Sometimes you do it through a friend or whatever, all kinds of games around the world, romantic kind of, I wonder. Because you know, if they have no interest in you, there's no chance of a relationship. You can want them all you want, but if they don't want you back, there's no romance gonna happen. No marriage gonna happen. And I wonder if that's what the Lord wants. He wants us, but he wants to be wanted. He says, seek me first, because he knows if we don't want him back, there's no chance of a relationship. Because God is not just Elohim and Yahweh, all-powerful creator. He's a person who wants a relationship. And it's just like any other real relationship. He wants to be wanted because he wants a relationship. He wants us. It's clear. Look at what he did with Jesus on the cross. It's clear that he wants us. He just wants us to reciprocate that. So a relationship can be birthed. Just like you want to be wanted. So I know this never happens here. But sometimes in America, somebody wants to attract somebody else and they, they get their number and they just keep texting them and texting them and texting them, hoping they'll respond finally. And you know, after the 144th text, oh, they liked me all along. No, it's not going to happen. But I wonder if that's how God feels. He gives us a sunset, his sunrise, beautiful ocean, starry night. He's texting us, trying to get our attention. Come on, will you please seek me? Will you please want me? Will you please wake up and desire me? I wonder if this is how the Lord feels too often. He keeps communicating 
I want you, I want you. And we're like, yeah, I kind of do. I kind of want you to. Oh, I want you on Sunday mornings. This great promise. If you seek me, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. He's looking for those who would seek him with all their heart. The promise is made for those who seek with all their heart. Not like, yeah, I kind of want you. Yeah, I kind of like you. You're pretty good. Those who seek him. Seeking his kingdom. I, could, could I just kind of uh, unpack it just for a second? Um, as we seek his kingdom, it draws us away from the things of the world as fast as our flesh could handle it. So we're seeking him, and it's just pulling us away from all the entanglement of the world. As we, as we seek him, it's a way of where, essentially, we're like ambassadors. We're inviting his authority. Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done. So imagine this. Tomorrow. Meetings you have. Friends at school. People at work. You're inviting God's kingdom. Lord, I want your kingdom to come. In this conversation, it's not just me and this person at lunch. I'm going to invite you to have a chair at the table, Jesus. And be a part of it. I want to bring your goodness and your mercy and your love. What do you want to do right here? You're inviting his authority for him to reign. You're inviting his kingdom. That's what Jesus said to pray every day. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. This is part of our regular lifestyle. Inviting his kingdom to come into, it's like you're an ambassador and you're taking his kingdom into every appointment you have, every meeting that you have. What a, an amazing adventure. Today, Lord, I want to take your kingdom with me and invite you to be the Lord of this situation. I want you to be present right here. Seeking first his kingdom because we know the kingdom of darkness is all around and we're asking the kingdom of, of light that Jesus came and he has all authority over darkness now to bring his light into this situation or that situation. To bring his goodness and his grace. So seeking first his kingdom is like, that's what we're doing. It's an adventure every day. Lord, I want to be a disciple that you're looking for him in every situation to show up. You're expecting it. You're praying for it. You're asking it. Isn't it interesting that he used, Jesus used the metaphor, money, over, uh, the pearl of great price, the lost coin. Remember the treasure in the field that the guy found out was so good, he went and sold everything and bought the field to get the treasure. He used this metaphor, money, like seek the kingdom like this. It's universally, it's like this unforced desire. Nobody has to beg people to want money. Everybody wants money. He goes, what if you sought the kingdom more than that? You got so excited, you forget all that. So, a disciple is a follower, is a seeker. I'll just do one more real quick. Um, is that okay? Are you, are you guys bored? Anybody asleep yet? Do I need somebody with a pole to come out? <laughs> just one, one, one last one. Um, I don't have time to get to all these, but a, a, a disciple is also renewing. Now, we know the famous verse that we've heard about, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's two different things, but let's talk about the renewing. Now, imagine you're a prisoner. You've been a prisoner your whole life. You were born in a prison, and you were raised in a prison. Everything you know, your frame of reference is a prisoner. You know, you get whatever food they give you in that prison, that's what you're stuck with. You have no value, no nothing you look forward to. There's no hope, no soft pillows, no good food to eat, no beauty, no art. Best thing you could hope to see is like a little weed that has a flower on it. And you've been in prison your whole life. Imagine the values of somebody who's been raised in a prison. So in the 1950s, there's this thing called the, the Korean War. And they took a lot of captives, American captives, British, other people, captives. And, the, and uh, uh, the North Koreans would put them in a prison camp. And that prison camp was run by the Chinese. And they, um, they would try to change the prisoners' way of thinking. They would try to br literally brainwash them. And um, you can see they starved them a lot, but they were, they were hammering them with how good it is to be communist, how good it is to be, you know, in the North Korea and in Chinese, and how bad America is, and how bad the rest of the West is, and how bad and bad. And they would do it and do it and do it until they started convincing them. So then they would get on television and say, man, the West is bad, America's bad, China's good. They like, literally brainwashed them. And so even to the point when the war was over, some of them actually stayed in China or North Korea. It worked so well on brainwashing them that even though the war is over, they still believed the, the lie that they had been brainwashed with. So, 
You think how a prisoner thinks. They have a whole different set of values. These guys refused to leave after the war was over. You know, they refused to return to their home country. They defended their enemies. And so it's really a weird way of, of you know, brain waves. Like how a prisoner thinks. Looking out for number one, stab or be stabbed, steal that food, or you will starve to death. And we kind of have a prison now. We're all in it. Like, look out for number one. You know, the coolest person is, is the best. You know, uh, it might be from Instagram or Facebook, what somebody looks like, acts like, the job they have, the money they have. We're a prisoner of those thoughts. So I wonder if this is the world that Jesus found when he came. He comes in person, and he finds a whole world that's prisoner of war. They've been taken captive by all the lies, even his own people, the Jews. They're all religious and this and that. And, like, and he kept trying to peel back those lies because lies are some, are, is a belief that's based on something that's false. For example, if you say, I have to cheat to get ahead, or I have to lie to get ahead, that's based on an, uh, an untruth. And some people, it's been baked into them so long, it's just, that's what they keep doing. So Jesus finds a whole world that's been submerged, like a prison, in false thinking. So every parable, every teaching, he's peeling back some of those lies. It's not based on reality. What if you discovered that everything you learned from the time you were young was a lie? Because everything we learn from our culture Obviously, there's some good things in every culture, but most things we learn, especially from the media culture, is all based on a lie. You know, what do you, what do, you do to be popular? What do you do to have a good life? Oh, have this, do this, eat this, wear this, and you'll have a great life. Things like my ride determines my value. My beach body determines my worth. My fame is the most important thing, so I want to get famous, 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 famous. But Jesus came with a different law. He goes, they call him the law of inversion. It's more blessed to give than receive. What? Yeah, he who's the least is the greatest. What? If your enemy, you know, does something to you, and, you know, turn the other cheek. What? Like, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the laws of the kingdom, the way the world was designed to work, how human relationships were meant to work. And it freaked people out. And I, oh, actually, um, ended up killing them. So Jesus used this word, metanoia, over and over again. It's the word repent. Metanoia is the Greek word for repent. It means change the way you're thinking, change the way you're thinking, change the way you're thinking, change the way you're thinking. Isn't it interesting? You can be born again, but still think like a slave. Isn't that what happened to the Jews who got delivered from Egypt? And they're in, and God's supplying, you know, for them every day, manna from heaven and quail and stuff. And they're like, let us go back to Egypt. We got free food there. We didn't have to go pick it up. That's how a slave thinks. So they'd been taken out of Egypt, but the mind of a prisoner, of a slave, was still inside them. Jesus kept saying, repent, not because you need to, oh, I'm so sorry, please. That's not repentance. Repentance is changing the way you're thinking. The way, only way you can do that is get new thoughts in your brain. So he said it again and again and again, repent, because he's trying to say, you know what? You've been submerged in a prison, and so you're living like a prisoner. I came to set you free, but you got to get your thinking changed if you want to live free. So, he's got something to say different about everything. About love, about marriage, about friendships, about business, about everything. That's his path. If you want to live in freedom, if you want to build your house on the rock, um, I'll just give you a couple closing thoughts here, and we'll pray. Um, think about it like this. Every one of us have a mind map. Our mind map is what is normal thinking for us. So, for example, if someone is mean to you and your instant reaction is, I'm going to cuss at them. I'm going to say a swear word. That's your mind map. You're, you have neural pathways. That that's your instant, instant response. If your mind map is somebody's mean to you and the person goes, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something kind. That's part of your mind map. It's an instant part of where your neural pathways go. It's your instant response. We all have mind maps about everything. For example, electricity. Maybe you got stung a couple times as a baby or as a child with electricity, and now you know you have a mind map. If you touch that thing, you're going you're to feel that, so you don't do it anymore. 
it, it's like part of your wiring, literally your wiring. So all of our mind maps look differently depending on our cultures and our families and the part of the world, what we think is right or wrong, what our instant responses are. We all have these ways of thinking. So Jesus was coming and saying, I need you to change your mind map. Because all the way your mind has been mapped is all like, I'm going to lie to get ahead. I'm going to stab somebody in the back. I'm going to deceive people if I can. But that's the way the world teaches us. Okay, how many of you have ever done this? You're watching a movie. The bank is being robbed. They're getting away with the money. And you found yourself rooting for the bad guys to get away with the money. Hurry, hurry, hurry. They're going to get you. Wait a minute. That's my money you're taking. What are you doing? And this is how the world subtly gets us to root for the wrong things, to create a mind map in us. We wouldn't really do that if it was our money, but it's just entertainment, right? And so with all these different mind maps, he's saying, hey, time to change the way you think. Renewing your mind is creating a whole different mind map. And so instead of just calling ourselves Christians, being saved, but thinking like a prisoner, that's how most people are. They're actually living like prisoners because they're prisoner of their mind, the way the world, they haven't been shaped. Their mind map has not been reshaped. Here's another way to think about it. Imagine you were born in this International Space Station, outer space. Your whole life, you were up there. You were floating your whole life. And you heard this thing called, this something called gravity. What? Gravity? No, it can't be. Oh, there's all kinds of studies on it. People write about it. People on Earth have gravity. Yeah, right. I guess it's there, but I don't really believe it. And so, because your whole life you've been in space, everything floats. You float, fruit floats, everything floats. And you get really brave one day and say, I'm going to the Earth. And so you come to the planet, you come here, and you're like, I heard gravity's real, but is it really? Like, I sort of believe it, but I'm not sure. Like, I heard that if you step off a cliff, you might crash and die or break your legs. But is it really real? Because I floated my whole life. So then you take a chance, and you jump off a stage or off a cliff, and you find out gravity's real. It's a principle. It's a law. You can't see it, but it's still real. Just like all the teachings of Jesus. And you get a hard lesson on gravity is really real. Now, those of us who lived on Earth our whole life, you don't, you don't go, oh no, I wonder if gravity is real. You're not even tempted to wonder if it's real. You know it's real. It's part of your mind map. You're not like, oh no, I'm about ready to break my legs here. Because you know it's real, and so you just back away from the cliff. You back away from the edge of the stage, right? It's part of your regular mind map. Wouldn't it be great if that's how we felt about every temptation in life? Like, we know that if we do that, if we lie, it's going to hurt us. If we cheat, it's going to come back to us. Because Jesus made the earth to operate a certain way. We renew our neural pathways so we, it becomes normal for us to do the godly thing. Did you follow me there? It becomes normal for us to not jump off a cliff because we know gravity's real. Every sin is a cliff. And every sin that you do, you got convinced. You got tricked. I won't have to pay consequences. Yes, you will. It may not be obedient, may not be uh, obvious to all, but it will happen. So the renewing of our mind is like convincing ourselves, just like if you lived on the space station, convincing yourself that gravity is real so you don't take a leap and break your legs, convincing ourselves that the way Jesus said to live is the best, and we're not going to take risk after risk. And to the point where we literally... Um, this neuroplasticity, things that happens in our brain, we can reshape our brain, how we think. It's like the first time you choose to do the right thing, it's like carving a trail in the jungle, right? You're hacking away with a machete, and like you make it, but you have to hack. Then the second time, it's a little bit easier because you've already made a trail. And the third and the fourth time, it gets easier. And after you do it like the hundredth or the two hundredth time, you've actually started to make a road there. It becomes normal thing. Your brain normally goes there. You're normally kind when somebody's mean to you. You normally tell the truth when you're tempted to lie. And you create these super highways of godliness. A renewed mind looks something like this. You keep building every day, scripture in your brain, a little bit more. You're building more roads, more su so it becomes the easiest way for your neurons to go to do the right thing, to do the godly thing. Your, your, your brain starts looking like this, all kinds of new godly habits. So it becomes normal to look more and more like Jesus. This is freedom. So if I could just encourage you that Scripture says you'll know the truth and 
you'll, you'll be set free. As you lean in and put scripture inside you and change your neural pathways, the truth, reality is way better than you can possibly, than I could possibly imagine it. And the more we get neuro pathways that are based on godliness, we get glimpses of him that we could never imagine before. So just one truth. Even if you just had one truth a week or one truth a month that really came alive to you, like one, here's one. If, if, if the world could get just this one, God created all mankind in his image. Just that one truth. If we really got that, if we really believed that, you know there would be no more slavery. There'd be no more unkind words. There'd be no more racism. Just one truth changed all of our behavior. Just one truth. No more bigotry, no more abuse. So the power of one truth. If I could um, just encourage us this morning. The, the, the goal today was not just to give you a bunch of things to do, but to give you some uh, new habits of effective disciples. And instead of saying, I'm gonna put six things on my list, just, just try this. One day a week, say, today, Lord, I wanna be a better follower. Better than I've ever done. And then tomorrow, Lord, I want to be a better seeker of your kingdom. And the next day, Lord, I want some part of my mind. What do you want to renew today, Lord? And the next day, I want, to, I want some area of transform. And just one day a week, choose one of these. Lord, I want this habit to mark my life today so I can become a better disciple. So, Father, right now, I just ask that you would help us. On the journey of discipleship, Lord, that we wouldn't be those that when the storms come and the wind comes and the wave comes, that we get blown over, that are, we get washed away, that we build our life on your words, Jesus. Could you just um, look inside your heart for just a second? Say, Lord, um, Maybe it's the following thing I mentioned. You know, Lord, I need to follow better. If that's you today, Lord, I just want to be a better follower. Maybe you've called yourself a Christian, you prayed a prayer, you know you're going to heaven, but you're like, I don't know if I've really been following. Like, I don't know if I've been a follower of Jesus. Maybe I've been part of the crowd and not really a disciple. I need to be a follower. Lord, I need to follow you better. If that's you, just lift your hand real high right now and just say, Lord, I need to follow you better. I need to be a follower, not just someone who calls himself a Christian, but a follower of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You see our hearts and our hands. Maybe today you're thinking, Lord, I need to be a better seeker of your kingdom. Like I seek my keys or I seek my phone. Lord, I want to seek your kingdom, your goodness, your presence, your reality in any situation. Lord, I want to bring your kingdom and your authority. If maybe that's the thing that spoke to your heart this morning. Lord, lift up, lift up your hand. If that's you. Lord, I want to be a better seeker of your kingdom. Maybe you'd say today, I've been a, a Christian. I've been loving Jesus, but my mind, I've been a slave. I have not renewed my mind like I should. I've been thinking like a prisoner, even though I'm free in my heart. There's some area you know you need to get free. Lift up your hand if that's you. Lord, I need to get free in this area. Just tell him what it is. We're getting ready for this whole Easter season, this week, Passion Week, next week's uh, celebration. Lord, let's walk into it with freedom. Lord, right now you've seen our hands go up. You've seen those that want to be followers. Just tell them that right now. I said, Lord, I'm going to follow you, not just call myself a Christian, but be a follower of Jesus. Follow your teaching. Follow you. Learn your words. Just tell them that. Lord, I'm going to be a seeker of your kingdom, not just somebody that talks about it or whatever, but like each day, moment by moment, representing your kingdom. Lord, some of us have been prisoners for so long in our thinking. Just say, Lord, I need you to give me some revelation on how to be free in my thinking in this area. I don't want to be free in my heart, but a prisoner in my mind. All, Lord, so that we might look more like you, reflect more of you, that we could be accused of looking so much like you that people would think that they've seen a glimpse of you, Jesus. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. So thank you, Pastor. Amen. Are there any followers of Jesus Christ in the house this morning? 
Hallelujah. Are there any followers of Jesus Christ in the house this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. Have you, have you been blessed by the word of God? If we are not living as disciples of Christ every single day, then we're not living our God-given purpose. All glory be to God. Thank you, Pastor Ron, for blessing our hearts. For those of you who would like to uh, purchase a copy of uh, Dr. Ron Lewis's books, they will be available at the counter in the back at the cost of 100 rand. You're welcome to do that. Amen. Are you blessed in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. Happy Palm Sunday to every one of you. And right now we're going to get ready to prepare our hearts to worship the Lord with the giving of our gifts. And as you do that, allow me to encourage you from the book of 2 Corinthians 9 verses 8. And it says, and God can bless you abundantly so that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Amen. Are you ready to live without lack? I'm ready to step into the place where I have lack of nothing. And that is the God that we serve. Amen. Shall we pray? Our gracious God, our eternal Father, as we come before you today, Lord, with the gifts that we have prepared, Father, we pray that it will it will be received by heaven and we will be blessed here on earth. Father, we pray that we will and we rebuke every spirit of lack and we pray lord that you will undertake for us in every area of our lives lord and in all things lord jesus we will give you the praise the glory and the honor in jesus name and everyone who said love the lord said amen, amen. of you, one thing that we desire, that as we worship you, Lord, come and change our lives. And arise, 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 arise. take your place, be
Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you, beloved. Uh, don't uh, forget our Easter services on Good Friday and Easter Sunday, the same time as our usual services. May God bless you richly. Can we all stand at this time? And I'm going to invite Pastor Nick Padiachi, and he's going to close in prayer for us. Shall we bow to prayer? Heavenly Father, we come to you once again through your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you this morning for your word that you encourage us, Lord, to become followers in your kingdom. Lord, I pray that you will bless our hearts, bless our spirits this morning. Thank you for your servant that has taught us this morning, Lord, not just to be a normal Christian, to become great disciples in your kingdom. And Father, at this time, we ask that your hands will be upon us, that even as we take leave from your presence, I pray, Lord, that you will protect every home and every family, Lord, even on those that are traveling out on this week. Many of them, Lord, that will be going out on vacations, Father, wherever your people go, bless them and seal them and cover them under your blood. And Father, we also thank you for the bishop as well, that even as he travels safe to back home, that you will grant unto him safety and protection. And even as he comes, we thank you, Lord, for the preparation of this week, Father, that when we come on Friday, Lord, help us to bring somebody to, the, to your kingdom. Lord, even as we are entrusted, Lord, to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ, to become followers in your kingdom, Lord, that we will be good examples, great examples of reaching out for the lost, the souls, and the perishing. Bless us now and give us a victorious week, a blessed and a fruitful week. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And Lord Jesus, we seal your blessing over us, over our families, over our lives, over the house of Bethsaida. For we go, Lord, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. And all those who love the Lord said, Amen. God bless you, church. Have a wonderful week in Jesus Christ. to 40 are you free this sunday march 24th excellent join us on our young adults first ever stage performance what a fun filled evening packed with a powerful message activities for both ladies and gents there'll be refreshments provided as well as fellowship afterwards if you have little ones bring them along we have an area that caters for your little bodies join us can't wait to see you